right, we're going to get started. This is a better showing than I thought there would be on July 2nd, so thank you. Um, some of you found it, but I do have books for sale in the back. I also have leftover Flannery short story books for sale that are also 15. And so if you want to, if, if I make you intrigued enough, you can go for both. I'm also happy to sign your book. It's awkward, but I'm happy to do it. Um, all right, so welcome to Books and Authors. Um, over this month, not counting July 16th, because we're celebrating our man, a AZ, um, we will have guest speakers come in and speak about their books published in the last year or two. Um, and I decided on this holiday weekend that it be best for me to take this slot. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about my book and allow time for questions. But first, let us pray. Lord God, thank you for St. Albans, and thank you for those who remind us of the good news of the gospel and the work of Jesus Christ and making us more like you through people like Flannery O'Connor. Amen. All right, so today I want to talk to you about my book. I am going to define every word you see up on the screen right now because I realized it is a mouthful. It's even spelling asceticism proves challenging. I've typed it so many times and I still stumble over it. But first, I want to introduce you to this lady, for those who do not know her. This is Miss Flannery O'Connor. Her first name is actually Mary, but she already sounded very Catholic and very Irish with the O'Connor, and so she dropped the Mary to just be Flannery. That also allowed her in her early stories to be published without people necessarily knowing she was a lady, which in the mid-20th century was helpful to get your book sold. And many people, when they found out that she was not a man, were surprised because of the force of her narrative, because who knew women could write so forcefully about violence and the work of God in the world? Uh, Flannery was born in 1925. She was born in Savannah, Georgia. Um, her father, as she was growing up, was diagnosed with lupus. And those of you who know anything about lupus know that it is genetic. And so they didn't know that he had it until he started developing symptoms. And once he did, Flannery came to know that she very likely would also have the possibility of getting lupus, which she did. So that's why you often see her with the crutches. Um, her father died when she was in her late teens, which led her to really become familiarized very quickly with sorrow and with loss and with everything not happening for a reason. And so she avoids sentimentality, and we'll talk a bit about that, but she avoids it because both in the loss of her dad and then the development of lupus, she knows full well that if God is working in the world, it involves pain and loss as well. It's, it's not without those things. Um, she died young, as you can see. Her first major book, um, no novel, Wise Blood, was published in 1951. She died in 1964, so her career was very short. Right as she was writing her first novel, she started to get sick. She was out in New York City on the East Coast hitting kind of a high on a writing career, and she had to come home very sick to her family farm, which she never left in Milledgeville, really, for the rest of her life, except for small speaking engagements. She didn't die of lupus, though. This is a good reminder of modern medicine. She died of a dirty IV while she was being treated for lupus. When I learned that, it just broke my heart, but I think that happened a lot, um, and probably still, sadly, does happen occasionally, though not as often. Uh, so Flannery, some of you might know the Iowa's Writers' Workshop. She did her master's there. That's how she really came into the influence of some of the biggest writers in the mid-20th century that really took this you know, small town lady from Savannah and then from Milledgeville, Georgia, and kind of gave her the tools um, to get her writing read. So she wrote a number of things. This first book is Wise Blood. That is um, her first novel. It is short. Um, it is what I use a lot in this book as my main kind of look. She then came out with a collection of short stories that is entitled A Good Man is Hard to Find. Those of you who have only read one thing from O'Connor, I would guess it is this story. 
um, and this was the namesake of her first collection of short stories. Her short stories are truly short, like many of them are around 15 pages, and they are punchy and direct and also full of mystery about what is actually happening. The why of the what is not always clear. She then wrote her second novel, The Violent Bear It Away, which is a much more sophisticated um, novel. You can kind of see her writing progress um, about 10 years after Wise Blood. And then she started getting sick. And as she was getting sick, she was finalizing her second short story collection, Everything That Rises Must Converge. But that was actually published, published posthumously. And she was, we have letters from her that say that she was writing one of those stories, Parker's Back, slipped under her pillow when no one was looking while she was in the hospital dying. And so we know that she was working on these stories until the very end. So in the back, the complete short stories are these two short story work collections in one place. She also wrote a number of essays. We're gonna read a couple quotes from those essays. Those essays often were presented first. It's how she made money was she spoke at a couple of schools actually in Texas and around the South and those are published in Mystery and Manners. And then also posthumously, the letters that she wrote were published in Letters of Being. All of this is also available in a Library of America collection in case you want everything Flannery wrote pretty much in one place um, there. Finally, more recently, a prayer journal was published. She had a prayer journal that she kept from when her dad was dying through her life. I don't know if she ever thought anyone would be reading these. Um, I don't know how I feel about them being published, but they exist, and so you know that they're there. Just read them with an eye to the fact that probably these were meant to be her own prayers, but they are also very funny. Like in one, she asked God, because she's taking herself too seriously, to make her cheese so that she took herself less seriously. She's an odd duck, and you see that even in her prayers. Um, like I said, Wise Blood was published in 1951. That was how she really broke on to the scene. And one of the reviewers who became a lifelong fan of her work wrote in the review this line. I think this captures Flannery really well. He wrote, Wise Blood is not about belly hunger nor religious nostalgia, but about the persistent craving of the soul. It is about man's inescapable need of his fearful, if blind, search for salvation. So that gives you kind of, if you haven't read Flannery, she is concerned with finding God and being found by God, but in a way that is not sappy or cheap or easy, but is costly. And she does not paint her protagonist always in the best light because she wants to reflect what it truly means for us humans and all of our humanness to find God. So some people, some Christians, go to read her stories, including Catholics, she had a lot of Catholic critics, go to read her stories and are like, I don't like this, this makes me uncomfortable, this isn't nice, and that's kind of the point for her. It's not meant to feel good, it's meant to feel true, is, is what Flannery does. For that reason, she often writes about the working of grace in the world by not actually speaking about grace. She uses negation to make the working of God present. She describes it this way. She says, often the nature of grace can be made plainly only by describing its absence. So rather than saying God is here, we witness a world where God does not feel present and then suddenly like a wind blows through and there's a change and we're not sure what it is. So grace works in that way, indirectly hinted at when you see these big changes in characters that are often violent or grotesque or just plain strange. So that's Flannery. A bit about how I found Flannery. So I'd read her a little bit before. I think many of us have kind of dabbled in the Flannery O'Connor. But while I was down the road in Tidwell Bible Building before it was beautifully renovated and still full of many dead cockroaches and mildew, um, those of you who remember those Tidwell days, um, I came here to write a PhD, and my plan, many of you know this, I have a background in Bible, my plan was to write it on theological interpretation. And so I was ready to do that, 
I had my whole big plan, and I started to read in a seminar by one of the doctoral professors, um, Flannery O'Connor short stories. And I had read them before, but I would never read them for like class, and so I would never like had to write about them, and you just tend to pay more attention when you have to write about something. Um, and so I was reading her short stories, and we read them for a number of weeks, and I kept on getting this like, I didn't know how to describe it. It was like this inkling of familiarity. I'm like, she tells stories in a way that feels really familiar to me. I don't know why, I don't know what it is, but it reminds me of, of how I felt when I was learning Hebrew, <laughs> which is a weird thing to think of when you're reading a 20th century Catholic novelist. That was exactly what I thought of. I'm like, this excitement that I feel about like being told something, but then having all this wonderment and curiosity and lack of confidence that I have it all figured out. I'm like, it reminds me early days translating, you know, Jonah or parts of Genesis. And so I started on this journey where I mentioned this to the person who was teaching this class and he said, that's interesting. No one has written about that. Maybe you should. And so I switched after some prayerful consideration and a whole lot of anxiety, I switched what I was going to write on because I was like, what about instead of arguing for a way to read the Bible, I actually bring a reading of the Bible into somewhere else and kind of show it off. It's like, what if I show off the value of reading scripture instead of arguing about it because I don't like arguing. So that brought me to what over many, many years became this phrase of stylistic asceticism. This for me, that inkling I had, that feeling that I couldn't name, but the similarity was there of the feeling of reading Flannery and translating Hebrew, that little thing, became known, and it took me a long time, I hate to admit, with the help of some very smart people, to come up with this idea of stylistic asceticism. So first, stylistic. This is exactly what you think it is. It is style. It is the way a story is told. That there is a way that stories are told in biblical Hebrew narrative especially and in Flannery O'Connor stories that have a certain style. And that style is direct, without a lot of detail, without a lot of internal dialogue or notes from the narrator on what to think. It is in fact quite like asceticism. Is, is that a familiar word I'm guessing to some of you? We know that ascetics, you know, those guys and gals that used to go off and live in caves or go on extreme fasting, and this belief that by removing things, removing the clutter from our life, we can draw nearer to God. It's the practice of asceticism. And what I found is that the style of this kind of storytelling, it's the same kind of clearing the stage clearing the clutter away, clearing everything you don't need there so that you can more easily hear and find God. And so stylistic asceticism is about style, sparely told stories, but not for any reason, but so that we can more clearly see the work of God without the usual clutter of things. Now, I like other kinds of stories. I like stories with all the details and all the world building and getting... I'm reading a story right now. Have any of you heard of the, um, my goodness, the, the Goblin Emperor? I think it's, a, it's actually pretty fantastic. But it's mostly narrative and internal dialogue. And in Flannery, you don't get a lot of internal dialogue. So I don't think other kind of stories are bad. But I think that there's something especially effective about communi communicating the work of grace, the work of God in the world, by telling a story sparely. Take a deep breath, because we're about to get into Hebrew. There is, in Hebrew, a very contested appearance that goes by many different names. Some of you who took Bible classes back in the day might have heard of the Vav consecutive. It went by that back in the day, but now it's called Vavayik Tol, and I'm sure it'll be called something else that'll date my book very quickly. But the Vayik Tol is the way of describing the sentence structure of biblical Hebrew narrative that frequently has clauses without subordination. So what that means is you would read a sentence like this, and maybe any of you, some of you can relate. And the woman woke up and drank coffee and sped off to church. 
We aren't told what time the woman woke up, how she was feeling when she woke up, what it looked like all around her when she woke up. We're just told she woke up. We don't even know where she woke up. We don't even know if she's at her home or if she's like sleeping out in her car. Out. We don't know where she is. We just know that she woke up. We drank coffee. We don't know if she drank coffee because she has a caffeine issue. We don't know if she drank coffee because she thinks it's delicious. We don't know what kind of coffee. We don't know what she puts in her coffee. We don't know if she drank coffee with anyone else. We just know she drank coffee. And then we know she sped off to church. We don't know if she sped off because she was excited or she was anxious or she was running late. So this is what I mean by successive clauses, things happening without subordination. We aren't given those details. It is just bam, bam, bam. That doesn't mean those details aren't important. It just means we need to fill them in. So Darren has my hand out. I want you to see how this works. Thank you, Darren. I didn't want you to have this until I explained this because I didn't want you to be freaked out by it. What I did, the big idea of my book, is showing how the Vayikto works first in the story of Jacob wrestling with the angel in Genesis 32, and then in the climactic moment of wise blood. So what you see in this handout, which is also in my book with more detail if you'd like to read about it, is what I call kind of the imposition of the Vayik Tol, of these kind of bam, bam, bam. It's like the Emerald, I should have called it the Emerald Lagasse of storytelling. The bam, bam, bam of storytelling. So those ands that I have in the handout are not in Flannery's stories unless they aren't in the little brackets. And the Hebrew, the Genesis 32 is my translation, which means I can put an and wherever I want. So I want you to see how a familiar story has what we often translate in the Hebrew as and he did, or but he did, or now he did, or so he did. In the Hebrew, it is one little letter that is the vav, the and. And we often as translators fill in these other conjunctions of because or and or so or but, which but is a contrastive that we insert that isn't necessarily there. But when you read through the Hebrew, you realize you just have this story, this really crazy story, that when you look at the subjects, you aren't even clear who is doing what in the wrestling match. We're not going to go into all this detail, but who's doing what in their wrestling match. And the linchpin moment of this scene of the wounding where the angel wounds Jacob, happens so quickly you barely notice it, and the story just keeps going. You spend more time on the dialogue than you do on the actual wounding. That is very quintessential of biblical Hebrew narrative, that things move really quickly. Any of you who were in our summer Bible study last summer remember this when we were reading about Jacob, about how quickly these stories move, and if we don't pay attention, we don't notice how much we aren't told not because it's unimportant, but because it's our job to be invited into it and wonder what is going on there. So, I do this in both the stories. I decided today I wasn't going to go into detail about wise bugs. Y'all haven't read the novel. And you can, you don't need to. But the big idea here is this protagonist who had been preaching at the top of his car, the Church of Christ without Christ, which is meant to be funny and silly, um, Hazel Moat thinks he has got it figured out, that he can dupe people, not, I, I think he kind of knows he's duping people, he, can, he sees the hypocrisy of Christians, and he's like, why don't I talk like I'm a preacher, but really I'm an anti-preacher, because I think the gospel and Christianity is worthless and foolish and stupid. And while he's doing that, his life is falling absolutely apart, he does some really shameful things. And then he decides he's gonna leave this small town and speed off to a bigger town in his car that he thinks is gonna get him there, even though right as he begins to leave town, he is told by a mechanic, this thing is a piece of crap and you're not gonna get anywhere with it. But in very Hayes fashion, in very human fashion, he ignores him because he needs to get on where he's going. And so we have this scene where he is driving off in his crappy car and he gets pulled over, not that far as he's leaving town. And he gets pulled over by this patrolman who um, asks if he has a license. And unsurprisingly, Hayes doesn't have a license. And what we find is that the patrolman um, pushes the car 
off the embankment, it falls, and Hayes sees this one sign of freedom falling away. The so big idea of this was that Hayes' confidence, what he was preaching on top of, what was getting him out of town, is now in ruins on the ground. And we have this moment where he looks out at it. We aren't told what happens or why, but then suddenly Hayes himself seems transformed. We would call it a kind of conversion. That something happens in a very quiet moment that many commentators who write on Wise Blood don't even take note of because it doesn't, what seems important is what he does later, which he blinds himself with quicklime which is really grotesque and noticeable, but it actually seems like something has changed before that ever happens. And so what I do is I show how the pacing hints that something is important, important is happening because we aren't told something important is happening. We just see what happens all around it. I don't know if you guys have ever um, experienced someone that you really love having an experience without you and they come back and before they even say anything, you can tell something happened. But that's kind of what we find in these narratives, some hint of something happening without us knowing what it is. What's really interesting about the ascetics, about biblical Hebrew narrative, and about Flannery, is that often that thing that happens is a kind of wounding, even as it is a blessing. That often what we find when we deny ourselves in order to draw near God, or when we wrestle with angels, even circumcising ourselves, that can't be comfortable, like any of those things that lead to blessing often involve a level of discomfort and of wounding. And Flannery picks that up in her stories. Sometimes the wounding leads to death, but we know that death itself has been defeated, and so does Flannery. So death is not even the end for her. And so in this book, I talk about the wounded victor in Jacob and the blinded comfort convert, blinded by himself, in wise blood, as a way of speaking about how God even works in our lives as a kind of wounded blessing, where a wound and a blessing go together. And there's this painting, I'm not good with French, but the painter Delacroix, I'll call him that, has this really magnificent painting, which you might have seen, of um, Jacob and the angel wrestling. It has this beautiful backdrop, and it took him forever to paint this painting. And when he writes about it, he writes about how he wrestled with it over and over again for years trying to get it right. And he found that as he was painting this picture of wrestling with God, he himself experienced his own wrestling of trying to get it right. And as I was reading about this painter, I discovered one of his sketches of this painting that comes out really elaborate, but this is a sketch of that painting, which is on the cover of my book, of Jacob wrestling with the angel. What do you notice about this painting, or this sketch? Is it easy to tell what you're looking at? Yeah. When you first look at it, you gotta take a moment, right? There's clearly a struggle, yeah. The, and both are, so the plot line is clear, but the details are not. That's exactly right, Aaron. There's more form, which is interesting, right? The character on the right is likely Jacob. The character on the left is likely this mysterious man that is, as you can see in my translation, not called an angel in the Hebrew, just called the man. But then we find out Jacob was face to face with God, so this man was no just man, right? That even the rendering itself kind of shows us what's going on in the story. And so I looked at this, and I thought, this is like a visual representation of what I think this kind of storytelling does. It gives us enough to know what had happened, but it doesn't give us enough to feel like we've got it figured out, goodbye. Instead, what it does is it invites us into prayerful consideration of how God is at work in these stories, of what God is doing in the characters that is not going to be obvious or comfortable, and that like Delacroix painting this painting might actually cost us something in the life of prayer and of wounding and blessing. So at the end of my book and my second to last big chapter, I talk about how I think that this kind of reading is itself a kind of prayer, 
But as we pray these stories that require kind of some skin in the game, we invite God into that experience, not just of interpreting what happened there, but what God might be doing in our lives through that reading event. So that's the big, like, big idea. So I wanted to end before we do questions with a couple thoughts from Flannery. Some of you have heard me talk about sentimentality a lot, and now you'll know why. So Flannery talks a lot about how she wants what she speaks about in her stories to be credible, to be truthful about how God actually works in the world. And to her, one of her greatest enemies is the sentimental rendering of God, that God is soft and nice and, you know, that everything happens for a reason. God wanted another angel, kind of, of God. So let me just read this quote. It's a little long. I'll break it down a little for you, though. But sentimentality is an excess a distortion of sentiment, usually in the direction of an overemphasis on innocence. And that innocence, whenever it is overemphasized in the ordinary human condition, tends by some natural law to become its opposite. That is, when we overemphasize the innocence, especially of the human before God, we end up actually perverting it because we aren't honest. We lost our innocence in the fall, and our return to it is through the redemption which, which was brought about by Christ's death and our slow participation in it. So we are not innocent, so we need to speak truly about that when we talk about what God is doing in and through us. Sentimentality is a skipping of this process in its concrete reality, so it's lived life, and an early arrival at a mock state of innocence, which strongly suggests its opposite. Pornography, on the other hand, is essentially sentimental, for it leaves out the connection of sex with its hard purpose and so far disconnects it from its meaning in life as to make it simply an experience for its own sake. So what she does here is she says there are two dangers in writing about God. The church and the fiction writer is the essay. There are two dangers in writing about God. One is sentimentality, where we make it all soft and cozy and pretend like we aren't sinful creatures bent on thwarting the will of God at every move. Like, we are sinners. The other one, though, is pornography, where you have all of the violence of our sinful nature without any of the working of God in the world. That those two things are essentially the same thing. They are both dishonest renderings of the way that God works in the world, which means that if we're going to speak truly about how God works in a fictional world or a real world, we need it to neither be completely innocent as though it is without sin, or only exploiting the violence and the sin without seeing the work of redemption. Those are her two big things. So one of the things that has, like, if you want to talk about like, transformed vision, any time, pastorally or otherwise, I'm thinking about what God is doing in the world, I ask myself, is this speaking truly, or am I making it overly sentimental or overly pornographic? One is despair, and one is just naivete that's unhelpful and actually hurtful to ourselves and those around us. This brings me to her using violence. She uses a lot of violence in her stories. The blinding your eyes with quicklime, pretty violent. She has one woman possibly find redemption by being bored by a, wool, a, a bull, essentially hugged around with horns in her side and her chest. She has a child baptize himself into a river in order to permanently find the river of God and drown. We have a lot of those stories with violence, but those violence are not pornographic. Instead, what are, they are for her is a credible way of speaking about how God works in the world. She says, our age, and this remains true some 75 years later, our age not only does not have a sharp eye for the almost imperceptible intrusions of grace, it no longer has much feeling for the nature of the violences which precede and follow them. Which means that if we can recognize grace at all, the work of God in the world at all, we often don't recognize that it's costly. I mentioned to one of you earlier that we like to talk about the world, we like things being nice and sweet and without violence, but we just need to remember what we did to God become love come down. Like we killed him. We didn't just kill him gently. We, like, slaughtered him. But this is what we do, and if we can't remember that, that violence is our disposition to, being, to encountering the goodness of God, 
then we've totally kind of missed it about what the story of grace really is. So she says, with the serious writer, violence is never an end in itself. That would be pornographic. It is the extreme situation that best reveals what we are essentially, what we are at our base. And so what we find in Flannery, what we find in biblical Hebrew narrative that is often pretty aggressive and confrontational and uncomfortable is a truthful, credible rendering of what it really means for us, beloved of God, but radically imperfect, to be loved and drawn to a God who is perfect. That that is what we see in this rendering. So that is all I have. So we have time for questions, which I'm sure I made everything so clear. <laughs> there are no questions at all. Or thoughts. Go. So us academics don't get agents, unless Paul's the cool one in the room that gets agents. We don't. We are like beggars and cheaters. That's how we are as academics. Um, but I, the way that we work is we tend to work directly with publishers. So publishers will either seek us out, we'll seek publishers out, we'll go to uncomfortable conferences and rub shoulders. And I actually had this book turned down by two big publishers. One, because books on theology and literature don't sell. And one, because they felt like the market was flooded on Flannery O'Connor. But this publisher, and I actually published an article before this was published that kind of helped give it credibility, found that it was really helpful. That it was a way of thinking, because you can find like books on the Old Testament themes or something in Flannery. But the idea of storytelling itself, I feel like is a, it's been appreciated, I think, by some. It's been really helpful for me even just talking about the Bible. It's given me like more clear descriptions of how we can see an invitation, which is the book I'm writing now, an invitation into biblical storytelling, not just about it being hard, but of it being hard for a purpose, to not make it easy on us on purpose so that it can do its work in us. Yeah. Rhonda. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Cormac McCarthy, may he rest in peace, has some of that. Graham Greene has some of that, that kind of spare storytelling. I think the difference between, well, especially McCarthy. McCarthy is someone whose faith was a, his own wrestling. Like, he, he tended towards a bit of hope with a lot of nihilism. And then um, Graham Greene tended towards a bit of hope with a lot of alcoholism and sex. Um, Flannery was a bit more pure in her kind of picture, but yeah, that's exactly right. That when you read, I actually read The Road while I was writing this, because I was like, I wonder how many parallels you have. But he, he helps us see the truth of humanity and of love and of kinship, not by spelling it all out for us, but by kind of showing it to us and being like, what do you do with this reader? with this picture of love in the midst of such despair. Yeah, so I think what you're sensing is right beyond just Flannery or biblical narrative. Yeah, Jesse? Yeah, yeah. 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 No, I think she's pointing out, I mean, I write about a good man um, in my book. I guess this is the one time where I can say that without being like a complete, you know, brat. Um, <laughs> but if you read, if you read A Good Man is Hard to Find and pay attention to the grandmother through the whole story and then pay attention to her conversation with the misfit at the end and what leads to her death, you will see a lot more than we're just bad and screwed up and violent. You will see from both of them a desire for kinship, from the misfit, a recognition that if the gospel is true, the whole world changes. And when 
communion is offered to you, whether you can accept it or refuse it rather violently. So there's, I think that's part of why a good man is hard for us to love Flannery. It's not because the story is bad, but often it's not taught well. It's not taught, and that's a tendency with Flannery, is people pretend like she's not Catholic. But she was very Catholic, and she believed that her Christian worldview shaped everything that she wrote, and she believed the gospel changed everything about our account of humans. Yeah. It's a, it's a very, but then you, of course, have the opposite, where people will sentimentalize Flannery and make it seem like a whole family being shot in the woods is fine because God's at work. It's like, no, it's not meant to be fine. It's just meant to be true, right? So Christians tend to, like, we, everyone struggles, but a lot of the critics that have liked Flannery have tried to kind of remove her from her Christian kind of perspective, which she unabashedly held and was quite loud about it. Like, she calls herself a Catholic in the South. As you guys know, that's not always, like, the most appealing thing to Southerners, but she, she owns it. Yeah, Alan. I mean, this is, I heard a little bit of Aaron's sermon, because I run around, as you guys know, but a little bit of his sermon is exactly this. On, on Independence Day weekend, the call from God to us is radical dependence. And we don't, we're like, no, I don't like that. Like, because radical dependence is not clear or straightforward or always comfortable, but that does seem like absolute surrender does seem the thing that we're called to, but it's our human proclivity to either make it touchy-feely, you know, so nice and sweet, or to despair. And yeah, I feel like the truthful, like for me, Flannery is truthful and credible about how God works in the world, which speaks to the power of fiction, that you would think like you need some big, long theological treatise to do it, but I, God has spoken more to me, sorry theologians, through Flannery than through many theologians about how God is actually working in this world and in me and of making myself aware of the temptation to either sentimentalize or give up. That there's this, I think you're totally right. Have any of you seen The Bear, by the way? That's, we just finished The Bear. We just finished season two. We were weeping on the couch last night. It is so beautifully this in its own way. It is, I'm sure many people are gonna be writing on this, but especially, you have to watch season one to get to season two. But season two is this picture of refusing either pole. And so I'd highly recommend it. There's going to be lots of swearing. I'm saying this to video people. Like, <laughs> yes, no, no, no. But it is a beautiful, a beautiful picture of humanity and reality and the possibility of redemption. And so I'd highly recommend it. Yeah, Anna. Yeah. So I would say, oh, this is good. So if you are going to read Flannery O'Connor for the first time, the first story I would read is Revelation. So I would read Revelation first, and then I would probably read Good Country People, and then I would email me and ask me what else. It's a longer <laughs> list. <laughs> I think Revelation, though, because Revelation doesn't let, it, it doesn't let the violence get in the way of reading her. 
And so I think it's a beautiful story, but it lets you get to the heart of her without the other stuff. My favorite story, my favorite story for impact is Parker's Back. And my favorite story to never stop reading is The River. Um, the River. Those are kind of my, my go-tos. But I love Wise Blood. Wise Blood is often looked over because it's her first novel and she like wrote pieces of it for like, but I think Hazel Motes is one of the most funny, interesting protagonists of any story I've ever read. Violent Barrett Away is good. It's a different kind of good, but they're both very good. And not all of her short stories are great and that's okay. Like I also want to say that. Some of them, she also wrote them while she was dying, some of them, and she wrote them while she was trying stuff out. So she's not perfect, but man, she's good. So, all right, I think we're gonna wrap. Thank you so much. I will have books for sale in the back. I love y'all a lot. <laughs>